question about four part. So let me start again. Welcome to the Cape Town Holocaust and Genocide's last session of our four part discussion forum, exploring the impossibilities of comparative approach to transitional justice. A warm welcome also to Director General Dr. And Mr. David Jensen Lin of the Taipei Liaison Office in Cape Town, our sponsor for the series. Our guest speakers, Dr. Helen, Helen Scanlon, <clears throat> Professor Jimmy Shu, Professor Suzanne Weigelin Schwerzig, and guests from around the world. The series, I'm sure you will agree, has been extremely interesting, informative, and probably has raised more questions than answers. In the last three sessions, we talked about the challenges of Taiwan, South Africa and Germany faced and still face in coming to terms with their past. Today, we want to develop a critical understanding of the concept of tradi traditional transitional justice as such and try to solve the question whether a comparative approach to transitional justice is helpful to understand the casual relationship between the implementation of TJ measures and their social effect, or whether each country must find their own way of reckoning with human, with past human rights abuses. This four parts webinar series was researched, organized, and will be moderated by Alexander Novakovic, our intern from the Austrian Service Abroad, Alex is studying Sinology, Modern China Studies at the University of Vienna, and is currently writing his master's thesis on transitional justice in Taiwan. At this stage, I would also like to thank my colleagues at the Cape Town Holocaust and Genocide Center for all the assistance they have given to Alex during this time. Before I hand over to Alex for the duration of the talk, all cameras and audio will be switched off. Should you have any comments or questions, please type them in the Q&A section, which is at the bottom of your screen. Okay, hello everyone. And also great welcome from, uh, from me. Uh, finally, uh, we are in the last discussion. I would like to ask our um, panelists to switch on the camera now as well. Um, and Jimmy, I saw him, he's not here as a panelist in this Zoom session, but as a um, as audience. So we just need to find a way to get him to be a panelist. So he has the right to use his camera as well as his microphone as well. So we will figure this out in a second. Um, but while we do this, oh, wonderful. So we, we managed. <laughs> so Jimmy, you can now try to switch on your camera and your microphone. In the meantime, I'm going to introduce our speakers. Um, wonderful. <laughs> OK, so um, one of our speakers is Professor Helen Skellen. She is the convener of the Justice and Transformation Program in the Department of Political um, Science of Political Studies in the University of Cape Town. Um, and she, teach, she actually teaches comparative transitional justice at UCT. So I'm very happy to welcome her here to the final discussion. And hopefully, you know, we can get some, some insights out. Yeah, usually I feel like these, these discussions about transitional justice ask, is there a one size fits all? And then the answer is always no. And then it ends. <laughs> so, so I hope that today we can go beyond that now and say maybe are there some structural similarities we can build up on. So this is the goal for today. Let's see if we make it. Um, before she joined UCT, she was the director of the Gender Justice Program in the International Center for Transitional Justice, the probably most prestigious, you know, Center for Transitional Justice. So again, I'm very happy to have Helen here. Um, then we have Professor Susanne Weigel in Schwierzig. Uh, she's Professor Emeritus of uh, Sinology, so Modern China Studies at University um, of Vienna. She has published extensively on topics related to historiography, memory studies and international relations with a special focus um, on contemporary history and politics in China. And she also happens to be my supervisor. <laughs> so thank you for coming. Um, last but not least, Jimmy Xu, he, he is an associate research professor um, 
in the Institute of Law at Academia Sinica in Taiwan, where he currently leads an interdisciplinary project exploring the ethical foundations of Taiwan's transitional justice and political reconciliation. And as I heard, there's a publication in preparation that it's going to come out soon. Yes, so this is something um, we can look forward to. Wonderful, so our speakers are here. And um, today I would like to touch upon three common themes, yeah, three topics, yeah? the role of economy uh, for transitioning countries, for transitional justice, the role of culture and the role of truth. And for each of these three things, I sort of prepared some questions and a personal statement about my thoughts. But before we get there, um, Helen agreed to give us a little introductory presentation um, yeah, sort of exploring her, yeah, telling us about her way, how she transitioned from a transitional justice practitioner to a scholar and some of the criticisms um, she holds towards that field. So, um, Helen, you have about 15 minutes, I would say the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Alexander. Um, I am going to share my screen. I just, um, could you let me know that that is up and running? Hopefully that's... Okay, you can see my screen now. Awesome. Okay, so um, thank you so much to the Holocaust Center and thank you to Alexander for putting together such an incredible program. I think um, for someone who's worked in the area of transitional justice for, for a number of years, uh, I've not had this comparative lens before of looking at, I, I knew absolutely nothing about Taiwan. Um, so I've been really, really grateful for the insights that have been offered and actually having the foresight to compare to Germany and South Africa, I think was was quite quite um, an innovative and really helpful approach. So so thank you very much for doing this. Um, I I think um, as um, it was just said that the more questions have been raised rather than answers, and um, I suspect what I'm going to do as well is continue on that track of, of raising more questions. But I thought I, I, I had a long discussion uh, over email with Alexander about this, and about some of the questions that have been raised. And, and as he mentioned, I sort of come from having worked and, and continuing to work in some capacity as a practitioner, um, but also working in the academic sphere. And one of the, the um, issues that have come up amongst many practitioners I've found recently is that we have this disjuncture between processes and aims. Um, we started off in the transitional justice field very much focusing on what the normative aims, and I've sort of picked out some of these here, you know, sort of what, what are our goals when we're, we're um, embarking on, a, on the quest for transitional justice? And um, I've picked out some key things here, which, which one of them being, you know, that first of all, we're trying to indicate that there's a clear break with a repressive past in some shape or form. And as I said, one of the refreshing things about this, this um, forum that's been organized here is actually looking at different types of regimes. Um, often the lens of transitional justice has been applied to post-conflict settings. Um, sitting in the South African situation, I found actually looking at other authoritarian regimes in some ways is a lot more helpful in understanding the challenges of realizing transitional justice in the South African context. And it also is very important in understanding the psyche um, that exists in the post-apartheid era here. Um, secondly, we talk about creating an accurate historical record for society. I thought it was very interesting in the first session uh, when there was discussions about truth in Taiwan and that, that the historical truth was very partial, that there was a specific period of history that was focused on and it wasn't a, a complete understanding of um, Taiwanized history that, that was the background to the oppression that happened and the violence that happened there. Similarly, in South Africa, we, we, we had a truth commission which focused on a particular period of the apartheid era, not the entire apartheid era, focused on a specific period from 1960 to 1994. And while there was lip service paid to sort of the preceding 350 years of colonial and apartheid history, um, that wasn't really the main focus of the truth 
that came out. And I think in some ways that has skewed our understanding, both of the past, but how we relate to the past in the present. Um, thirdly, they, we talk about providing recognition and justice for victims and some degree of accountability for perpetrators. And again, um, I would like to sort of, you know, emphasize the difference that we, we um, place here on sort of what is imposed rather than pre-posed solutions um, in transitional justice. So um, to what, what type of justice are we talking about for victims and to what level is accountability realized for perpetrators? I got the impression, and I'm still learning and would like to learn more about Taiwan, but that, that the accountability issue is something that seems to have fallen away. Um, I've just come from a forum this morning, which was dealing specifically with economic crimes in South Africa. Um, and again, this issue of accountability and the lack of accountability and the impact on current day uh, impunity um, for economic crimes is so evident in this country. Um, so the real accountability for perpetrators is something I think that, that, that we really need to interrogate as in who do we mean by perpetrators as well. Um, um, thirdly, we talk about, or fourthly, we talk about um, elite replacements through either a lustration process or some degree of reform. Um, definitely, again, when I'm talking about the economic justice issue that we've been talking about in South Africa today, um, we haven't seen that elite replacement when it comes to the economic sector. Um, and again, when we're talking about this in transitional justice um, in Taiwan, I mean, I'd be very interested to see to what extent, again, from, from my limited understanding from, from this exchange, it appears that um, elites have remained largely unchallenged through the transitional justice process. Um, Fifthly, we talk about um, the, the, the nunca mass, never again. We, we, we need to prevent human rights abuses um, happening again. We need to promote human rights. Um, we've seen a continued emphasis in transitional justice that when we're talking about human rights abuses, when we're talking about human rights, we differentiate between civil and political rights and social and economic rights. There's a hierarchy created here. Um, and as my colleague Kelly Van Buren said earlier today, we talk about streams of human rights when in fact it's a river um, and we need to remember it as a river um, and not look at the different streams. Um, restoring rule of law and reforming institutions um, also is seen as a bedrock of transitional justice. But again, there is a way that one can restore rule of law. I mean, rule of law existed to, in some um, capacity in Taiwan as in South Africa is the type of rule of law that we're, we're, we're um, problematizing. And reforming institution means that you've actually got to change the culture of those institutions as well. It's not enough to actually um, talk about legal change. We have to look at how we bring about deeper systemic changes as well. Um, and ultimately, we talk about healing divisions. If those these other things are achieved, that divisions can be healed, uh, promoting coexistence and sustainable peace. However, as I said, as, as, we, as long as we continue to think about streams as opposed to a river of injustice, um, we are failing to really understand how to heal those divisions in society. Um, so just in terms of um, what I would see, I actually see that I haven't given you the full um, screen. Um, challenges. Um, and I, I, I sort of, it, it, you know, I, I've spoken to these in some, in some capacity in the previous slides. But um, again, we kind of look at um, the, the obstacles to realizing transitional justice, which are, um, are very real, such as scarce human and material resources. But there's the big issue of political will. Um, again, I think um, it was spoken about in the in the Taiwanese context that we talk about um, lack of evidence and lack of documentation and what you do in in those circumstances. Um, we we've seen recently in the South African context actually. It's, it's possible to find archives. Um, they may not be within the country. They may be elsewhere. There may be other sources. But um, the important thing is that people have to keep looking. People have to keep fighting for justice. Um, and that with transitional justice, we often see it as an event or a price um, rather than a process. So um, when I talk about the disjunction now between what practitioners are saying um, and um, 
current realities is the obsession with the processes, whether that be truth seeking, whether that be criminal accountability for individuals, whether that be reparative justice or whether that be reform of institutions, the obsession that we have to do these processes rather than looking at what the normative aims and what the outcome should be means that we're looking at this as a short term thing, usually because it's um, it's something that is often being externalized now. Um, and as a result, people feel once you've reached a certain point, you've, you've realized certain processes, then we move on and society moves on, um, that we draw a line in it with the past. Um, I think in terms of the challenges that I've identified here, I think it applies to, to all of the contexts we've talked about. There's been a visibilization um, of certain types of crimes, um, whether conscious or unconscious. There are certain types of um, violations that have been prioritized at the expense of other types of violations. Um, we've also seen um, that often there is a blurring of lines between victims and perpetrators, and that's not necessarily necessarily realised through transitional justice processes, which work with a very clear idea of who is a perpetrator and who is a victim. Once we get into the grey zone, it actually disrupts um, transitional justice. Um, and, but we've got to learn to operate within the grey zone. And I think South Africa, it came up very clearly on the session on South Africa. Our focus in South Africa on perpetrators as being those who committed crimes in the name of the apartheid state, blurred the um, visibility of um, those who benefited, the beneficiaries of the system, um, and the beneficiaries who have remained unchallenged within post-apartheid society. And that that, that comes, um, I think Shirley may have spoken to it, but it's, it's, it's been a recurrent theme amongst um, members of the South African Coalition for Transitional Justice um, amongst discussions we're having in South Africa, that we actually need to revisit this idea that came from our Truth Commission here, that all beneficiaries in some way have to buy into a reparations program, that everyone who benefited should contribute some kind of wealth tax. That comes to individuals, that also applies to corporations. This was one of the, the stated intents or, or recommendations of the Truth Commission here, and it was one that society never followed through with, um, particularly white society. Um, and that remains something which could actually send a huge message about separating or acknowledging people's roles and not looking at a few bad apples in the cart that were responsible for the crimes that existed. And I think historically we're seeing more and more that sort of the individualization of crimes that happened in Nuremberg has been adopted as sort of a theme within transitional justice, but that allows us to actually um, obscure structural violence and to obscure the many people and the many systems that actually buttressed um, systems of oppression and violence. Um, so um, the critiques that, that are increasingly coming out is that we, we're looking at the prescriptive nature. I think um, Alex spoke to this um, at the beginning, that sort of this one size fits all, um, the problems with this. Um, and that when we have this prescriptive um, nature of transitional justice, we actually exclude alternative discourse or, or, or modes of dealing with the past. Um, also that we've seen um, increasingly that a lot of the transitional justice processes are internationally imposed rather than organic and locally led. Um, the South African process was organic to a large extent um, and locally led to, to a large extent. But as transitional justice has evolved globally, we've seen more and more that the emphasis has been placed that these other processes must be done in order for you to realise peace. Um, uh, as I mentioned, there's, there's this implication that there's an easy categorization of uh, for example, who is a victim and who is a perpetrator, but also that there's certain crimes can be easily categorized, you know, whether it that, that, that rape is a, a particular type of crime or torture um, is a separate crime. Um, we've seen sort of the, the blurring or the problematization of that when um, with the International Criminal Court, where when they were dealing with the um, post-electoral violence in Kenya, they chose to identify sexual violence against men as torture and sexual violence against 
women as rape. So separating the two. Um, and the, these sort of easy categorizations, certainly not easy in these cases, but um, it, it, it creates challenges because it's not always that easy to identify specific crimes, especially when we're getting into the economic realm. Um, the emphasis on the role of the public sphere um, ignores the private natures of crimes often. Um, so that's when crimes move uh, into the domestic realm, um, crimes happen behind closed door, economic crimes um, that happen. These, um, the emphasis on civil political rights um, and but the rights of uh, violations of bodily integrity tend to sort of ignore the, the broader ways that violence seeps into every aspect of society. Um, as I've mentioned, we, we see this over-reliance on law as a paradigm for addressing injustice. And finally, which, which I keep bringing up, is that socioeconomic crimes are, are largely ignored in this, um, in this system. So having said that, what happens if we don't? What happens if we don't go ahead with transitional justice? Um, and I think it's very clear, and it, we just only have to look at our neighbours around South Africa, we see impunity becoming entrenched. Um, we see distrust between citizens being continued. Um, we see politics remaining dominated by undemocratic elites. Um, or we see older late elites perpetuate denialism of the past. Um, and the past continuing to inform the present. However, I say all of this with a sort of disclaimer that we could apply all of these categories to South Africa right now, that to some extent impunity has been entrenched, particularly as I mentioned about economic crimes. Um, the reconciliation barometer that is um, conducted yearly by the Institute for Justice and, Re and Reconciliation shows that distrust between uh, different racial communities in South Africa remains rife. Um, politics does remain dominated by undemocratic elites if we look at um, uh, sort of broader politics, not just um, in, in parliament. Um, we see old elites uh, perpetuating denialism of the past. We saw it most recently with the former president de Klerk saying that apartheid was not a crime against humanity. Um, and I think very much given that South Africa is the most unequal society in the, role, in the world, has been for the last 10 years, the past continues to inform the present. Um, so, as a practitioner um, and a scholar, I would say that the problem in South Africa stems from the failure to fully realize transitional justice. And I would like to go back to Rama Mani, um, who is a, a scholar and activist um, who, who put, pulled out three versions of justice. And she spoke about it in, in relationship to, um, to post-conflict settings, but I think it's just as applicable to post-authoritarian just as applicable to post-totalitarian. And she says that we need to be thinking about not just rectif rectificatory justice, which is generally where TJ is lo uh, located. So looking back, looking at the consequences of violence, but we need to also be thinking about the legal justice that allowed that to happen. And more importantly, we need to be thinking about distributive justice and how we need to address the underlying structural systematic causes and distributive inequalities that allow marginalization and, um, and violations to happen in the first place. Um, fundamentally, I think if we go back to, to the question that Alex asked me, sort of, you know, um, does truth or transitional justice um, unite or divide? I think if we actually get to a point where we start having real conversations about issues such as dis distributive justice, we will be able to address the root causes or the, the fundamental normative aims that transitional justice tries to achieve. And I will stop there. I hope I did wonderful. that Wonderful, wonderful, yeah, wonderful. You were in time and you talked exactly about the things I want to talk about today. So Great. wonderful. Um, so you can now um, maybe stop sharing your presentation again? Yes. So um, before I ask you one more question, Helen, just two clarifications, um, um, or maybe maybe the most important clarification about the archive issue in Taiwan. So it's not like, it's not that there's a lack of evidence. The archives are there, uh, and the archive material is there, but there's no access to it. 
Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 So that that's the thing. Actually, you know, the apartheid government they destroyed a lot of files, um, um, and and also in in Japan, you know, when after Second World War, there were a lot of um, archive materials lost um, when when Tokyo was bombed. But also there was a uh, an order to destroy archive material. So this is a different issue. In Taiwan, there is there are the archives, um, but but it's a very delicate issue. I can talk about this with Jimmy later, maybe. Yeah. Um, the archives are there, but but they are under um, yeah they they're not there's no access to it. Um, so talk, let's talk about that. Let's continue talking about that economic aspect. So when you look at, and Helen, last time when you were here at the center, you participated at a talk called How to Make Never Again a Reality. So when you look at when what political scientists, not transitional justice scholars, but political scientists write about democratic survival, not democratization, but democratic survival, mm -hmm. they will say for democratic survival, you need a diversified economy, you need a GDP per capita above a certain level. You need um, low downward social mobility and so on. So what they say is that democratic survival is much more um, an interest based story. We mm -hmm. have democracy when we want democracy and we want democracy when the economy is running well. So how do you explain the disjuncture between this very normative approach, transitional justice um, as a concept uses, and what political scientists say about democratic survival? So it's, it's, it's a very interesting question. Um, I, I, you know, one of the examples that, that keeps coming up for me recently has been around Northern Ireland. Um, and um, I think sort of just to try and marry some of the discussions that um, there was in the 2000s, there was a lot of discussion around whether amongst the younger generation there had been the reconciliation that people had been speaking of. Um, and that suddenly you now were not seeing the divisions, apparent divisions um, on um, sectarian lines in, in, um, in Northern Ireland. Um, and this was largely explained because of um, you talk about interest based economies that that suddenly you saw marginalized communities, a younger generation within the Catholic community, suddenly having more access to the economy um, and that this sort of changing the game in Northern Ireland. Um, and um, and it's been quite interesting to observe how interests have shifted as a result of Brexit recently and discussions have changed. Um, and so I, I'm not sure if I can really answer your question about um, interest-based economies and the normative aims, um, but I think when we talk about transitional justice, there's often a, quite a lot of um, philosophical underpinnings to it about human nature. Um, and I think that there is that still still coming sort of from that restorative justice idea of shared humanity and a shared idea of what we can what we can achieve. And I think a lot of the normative aims, even the retributive justice element of it, still pushes forward the idea that you can promote a society which is just that you can have a just peace going forward, which is based on bringing out the best in our common humanity, which I think is a different emphasis to sort of that pragmatic interest-based economy approach. Um, and I suspect it's more because of sort of, you know, we see those trends. I know one of the issues you wanted to bring up was around culture and religion. Um, and because of those we'll strands, death, yeah. yeah, those strands sort of intertwine quite commonly within the transitional justice philosophical basis. And I think ultimately that sort of we, we, we are trying to build a society that is better rather than just about being interest-based. Okay, um, um, I, I will tell you where I'm coming from. Uh, the, we, we have a comment from one of our, from our, from our audience said that most of the political archives are actually accessible. That is true. What I was referring to was that the names of the perpetrators, that's the thing. This is still disclosed, yeah. Um, so, in Taiwan, there's this discussion, you know, from people who are for, who are against transitional justice, that transitional justice is an ideology. 
And um, from transitional justice scholars, you sometimes can get this allergic reaction. They say, no, this is not an ideology. This is a very serious academic field. There is a journal for transitional justice. There are thousands of publications of transitional about transitional justice. How could you claim that this is an ideology? Yeah. And I found very interesting the dissertation um, of a scholar called David um, Hu Hujenboom, yeah, called Theorizing Transitional Justice. Um, and he says the major deficiency, and you just talked about this, Helen, yeah, of transitional justice is this prioritization of civil and political rights over socioeconomic rights. And what he explains is that transitional justice as a theorist actually started developing um, in the 90s, at parallel to Fukuyama's notion of the end of history. Mm -hmm. And he says this whole field has actually prioritized research outcomes that were in line with this idea of the end of history. You just need to get to be a democracy, you need to consolidate it, and then you have reached the final stage. And when you don't consolidate it, there is the danger that democracy will erode again. And because of this, this whole field has prioritized sort of research outcomes that were in line with this idea of the end of history, whereas the field has marginalized um, research outcomes that were in contradiction with the end of history. So when we ask, is transitional justice an ideology? I would say yes, but only in the sense how much Fukuyama <laughs> we still have in there. And you can, you can actually see this in Taiwan, how this is working. Yeah? So when you read the report of the um, Taiwan Association for Truth and Reconciliation, which was published in 2015, but also if you need to read the newest report of the Transitional Justice Commission. Yeah? So you have people asking, what do we have to do with, so what happens to a country when they deal with the perpetrators? And um, then they sort of start to list what happened in countries that try to enforce um, you know, punishing perpetrators, but then they realized that going too strongly towards that direction is actually threatening social stability. So they had to draw back. And they list all these countries where punishing perpetrators was not beneficial for a peaceful, you know, development of the democracy. And then in the next paragraph, they write, but in Taiwan, we want to punish our perpetrators. Yeah. And in the, in the TJC report, you can also find, you know, transitional justice and there are different concepts of justice and sometimes they are in conflict with each other. So sometimes you need to make concessions. And in the next paragraph, they write, we don't want to make concessions. We want to punish the perpetrators because only when we have justice, we're a full democracy. Yeah? So, so this is where I have this normative idea sort of, I, I would not, calling it ideology is maybe going too far but there is sort of a, an unreflected normativity in that field, which is a big problem. And um, I love that you just mentioned Ramamani because the way how I understand this concept yeah, is that there are three dimensions of justice we need to balance out. Yeah. So there's legal justice, which I understand as basically democracy, yeah? establishing democracy. And then there is this idea of rectificatory justice, meaning punishing the perpetrators, giving compensation to victims, giving them trauma support, whatever we understand under making up for the past. And then there is a third dimension, which is the economic dimension. And in South Africa, for example, so usually when countries democratize, this is a zero sum game and you cannot get everything. You need to make concessions. If you want to have a bit more of this, you need to make concessions on that or the other way around. In East Germany, for example, there's this famous quote, we want the justice, but we only got the rule of law. So you got legal justice, but in order for you, for you to get legal justice, you needed to make concessions on the part of retributive justice. And this is also how I understand and please correct me if I'm wrong, but this is how I understand the South African negotiation process. So during the negotiations, I think the ANC had basically three options. They could have continued the struggle, yeah, go retributive justice all the way. They could have said, um, we want to be very good decolonizers. 
and um, we want an, a wide exodus, you know, so we can start from scratch. Um, so don't punish the perpetrators, but get all this, you get the whole white minority out of the country. Or you could go for the third option, which Mandela took, which is granting amnesty, but reintegrating the white minority sort of into the whole society, because it is them that controlled the economy for hundreds of years during colonialism, but also because the apartheid government invested into the white minority. And, and you can find this in Fukuyama. You can find this, him saying the biggest threat during the negotiation process was sort of preventing a white exodus from happening. But Mandela also says this in The Long Walk to Freedom. He says, we did not want to destroy the country before we freed it and to drive the whites away would devastate the nation. And this is the first dilemma because you just talked about impunity towards the economic elites, but you need the economic elites to solve the biggest problem of this country, which is poverty. So, so this, is a, this is a dilemma and what do you then define as justice? driving all white people away. And then you can say, you know, we, we're now having a white West or actually getting the white people and the economic elites into your boat and creating an economy which can then solve the problem of poverty. And this is actually, and this is my last phase here, then I will let you comment here. I think this is actually at the core of the South African reconciliation process. Yeah, less this whole story about truth and reconciliation, blah, blah, but, the promise for a better material life and a prosperous life with food and water and electricity, ha ha, and a home and jobs, yeah? So reconciliation was done by attacking the socioeconomic problem. And this is, yeah, I think, and the reason why there is so much dissatisfaction with the TRC today is yes, partly because there was impunity because of the perpetrators and yes, partly because there was no you know, compensation, but mainly because the socioeconomic problem and all the promises for a better, a better material life and a more prosperous future and the rainbow nation, because this has not changed. Okay, there, there's so much there. Uh, <laughs> under, uh, um, I mean, I, I think just as sort of as a, a, a point of clarity, um, I mean, I think it's important to remember that when the negotiations happened, um, both in both cadastres, at that point there were no victors. Okay, so so we're, we're talking about the situation that the ANC had not won, um, and neither of the apartheid government. Um, so there was a need for a negotiation at that point. So it wasn't that, that the ANC could impose anything or the, the liberation movements because no one side had won. So when we talk about the three justices that were discussed during Cadessa, so um, initially sort of the idea of um, criminal justice that was quite quickly dismissed and it was put forward. Actually, it was the... the, the um, um, the ANC that had suggested this idea of amnesty um, as a way, as a sort of concession that came forward, but already there'd been um, amnesties awarded behind closed doors um, that, that we're, we're still only just finding out about. Um, the idea of social justice was one as well during the negotiations that got, got dismissed and put to one side because what happens is then you have this political justice that's decided on. So the political justice then takes these two adversaries. You've got two people who were fighting the sides that were fighting for liberation uh, for, for um, the apartheid government. And now you turn them into political, you legitimize them and you turn them into political adversaries. So, so ultimately, in those negotiations, and because of the specific circumstances of those negotiations, you see a compromise that is made where you have political adversaries who now play out in the, in the political realm. Um, but those other two other forms of justice are then kind of put to one side in the negotiations. And as much as you say, you know, you talk about sort of um, the, the fear which, which I, I think if you talk to any of the commissioners now, that they'll, they'll, they'll talk a lot about sort of the fear that existed at that particular point in South African history. But South Africa is the most unequal society in the world in 2022, okay? So the poverty is greater 
amongst black some some black South Africans than in other parts of Africa. Now, so so you have to sort of and and you've got to look at the historic roots of those that inequality and the burgeoning inequality that's happened. And I think what you what you you're, you're saying is really interesting. That the previous point you were making about you know sort of what you do during um, sort of uh, you know the realization of prosecution or the realization of retributive justice. Um, it, but you look at all the different situations where retributive justice gets get sidelined after there's quite a strong push for it. And you look at around issues like the rec economic reconciliation bill in Tunisia, where you see actually consistently that powers move to ensure that really there isn't that much change. Um, and, and the South African model, I think Huntington talks about it as, as transplanting as opposed to transformation. So you, so, so you haven't actually seen a transformation as a result of the transition in South Africa. Um, and that was just sort of cemented through the truth and reconciliation process, um, that actually that real transformative justice or, or what, what um, the distributive justice or the three, three aspects that, that Manny talks about just were not realized here in any real form, sort of there was a tick box thing. Um, so, I mean, there's too much for you to raise and I don't want to eat into the time of the other speakers, but I mean, this could be like a week long discussion, definitely not two hours. <laughs> okay, um, let me go to Professor Weigelin. So let's, um, I, I just talked about these, we just talked about these three dimensions of justice, you know, establishing democracy, legal justice, um, rectificatory justice, dealing with the perpetrators and the victims, and socioeconomic justice. And transitional justice usually puts establishing democracy sort of the priority, and then you see how you sort of order the other interests and justices. And when I think of a country that puts socioeconomic justice, if you want, or at least let's not say so socio, let's say economic development at the, as a priority, then it is China. So, so I want to ask you, what does it mean um, if, if there is a country, you know, that says economic development is the priority and then all the other things come after? And, and um, how Mani puts, Mani puts it, it's a problem of distribution, but it's not only distribution, it's actually also a problem of wealth creation. So, so what, what does it mean? I don't know. This is a very abstract question for you, but I know you like abstract questions. Yeah. What does it mean for democracies if we have this? Yeah, if, if we have a regime that says economic development is basically justice and then the rest follows after that. Uh, thank you for this hard question. And um, I think I would like to refer to the People's Republic of China and to Germany in answering your question. Because in both cases, we see that economic development was very, very important in order to find some kind of societal um, peace after going through a period of dictatorial uh, and uh, dictatorial regime. So it's very interesting that we never speak about transitional justice when we look at the People's Republic of China, uh, because of course, <clears throat> the People's Republic of China did not establish democratization as the main aim of the whole process. But um, if we look at you know, what, um, what Helen just uh, defined sort of as the goals uh, of transitional justice, I find that uh, many of those seven goals you mentioned, Helen, in your presentation, uh, somehow played a very important role in the People's Republic of China. Although we did not have, of course, a process of democratization. For example, uh, we wanted to have a clear indication um, that uh, we needed to break with the past. This was very, very true for the 1970s and 80s in the People's Republic of China. Uh, we also wanted to create an accurate um, narrative on what had happened in the past. And uh, I think, you know, up until maybe 2012, when uh, Xi Jinping took over, uh, China was going through an immense uh, sort of process of rewriting the history of post-49 China, and also including 
the history of pre-49 China. So they were actually trying to, to, to sort of create an accurate, uh, accurate narrative of the past. And, and um, I think this was also true for many of the individual cases they actually went through. Um, finally, recognition of the victims and accountability of the perpetrators is something that was really difficult in a situation where we did not have any kind of regime change. And uh, to a certain degree, I think neither the victims nor the perpetrators are happy about the situation in China as of today. But um, at least uh, in the form of the so-called rehabilitation movement, um, China actually went through a process of many years of rehabilitating, this is how they call it, uh, the victims of the Cultural Revolution, at least symbolically. So they think that this is some kind of recognition for the victims, although the victims themselves don't think that the leadership has done enough. Okay, elite replacement. Uh, of course, if you stick to this uh, communist system in the People's Republic of China, you cannot replace your elite. But when you think in terms of the Communist Party of China, there was a complete elite replacement uh, when the people responsible for the uh, Cultural Revolution were actually dismissed from office, whereas those people who were victims inside the party were actually allowed to, to uh, re-enter the system and take over leadership positions. So there was in, you know, within the system of the People's Republic of China, there was a complete elite replacement. And so on and so forth. I don't want to go through all those seven things, but I think it is really interesting to, to see that um, when Helen talked about the, the seven goals, she did not mention democratization as mm -hmm. a goal. And if you do not mention democratization as a goal, you suddenly end up saying, oh, you know what? Actually, China was going through a period of transitional justice <laughs> after the end of the Cultural Revolution. And, uh, when, uh, and of course, the economic factor was a very, very important driving force because the country was in a severe economic crisis at the end of the Cultural Revolution. And as a matter of fact, the leadership of the Communist Party of China actually thought that giving recompensations to some of those people who were victims during the Cultural Revolution would actually make this economy run again because they wanted to distribute money to people in order for their purchasing power to become stronger and to have the, the, the whole uh, country go into an upward um, development with regard to economy because of the purchasing power of these people growing so much that they could actually uh, afford to buy many things they couldn't afford to buy before. So the economy was a drive, uh, the, sort of the economic compensation was a driving force for the economy to develop. And at the same time, it was a very important uh, instrument in making people feel happy. And why did they do this? To a certain degree, they did this because they looked at Germany. And in Germany, after the end of World War II, of course, the country was in a very, very deep economic crisis. People were very, very poor. And they actually decided that they wanted to get the economy going and make people focus on their better lives rather than think about the past. So in, in Germany, the economic development was actually a very, very important instrument in reconciliating society after the end of World War II. And why did this happen in Germany? And why did this not happen in South Africa? Well, my very easy answer to this very complicated question is the following. Germany was divided into two states and the one part of Germany was socialist and the other part was capitalist. And so the capitalist part had to make sure that the economy was running well so that the socialist part would not be able to take over the whole of Germany, which was not clear immediately after World War II and wasn't even clear immediately after the founding uh, of the two Germanys. So, so the, the so-called um, soziale Marktwirtschaft, the social uh, economic system that Germany implemented after World War II, West Germany implemented, was a reaction to the pressure it received 
from the socialist part of the country. And this pressure never existed in South Africa. South Africa embarked on its process of a um, transitional justice in a situation where neoliberalism was regarded all over the world as the instrument that could actually solve our economic problems. And neoliberalism doesn't calculate on giving money to the poor so that the poor could actually uh, uh, buy things and get the economy growing. And I think this is a very, very important sort of uh, background that is also true for Taiwan, that the dominance of neoliberalist thought was actually the reason why the economy was not included into uh, the whole process of transitional justice. I think I think this this economic aspect and we really yeah ne neoliberalism we really need need to take this into account because when we talk about the economic aspect in transitional justice we usually talk about distribution but there's really this point of wealth creation itself that is sort of over overlooked and I think even in the in the case of Germany we could ask the very provocative question what helped Germany democratize democratize more? Was it the Nuremberg trials or was it the Marshall Plan? So I think I think this is an, an important discussion we need to have. Um, I think, so this is what I wanted to, uh, you know, talk about economy. Now I would like to move on to the next topic, which is the topic of culture. So Jimmy, <laughs> I would like to ask you two questions. Yeah. The first question is, were you surprised when you heard that religion did not play such a prominent role during uh, the, you know, uh, TRC in, in South Africa. Um, and second question, do you think is there, let's call it an East Asian idea of justice that plays a somewhat important role in Taiwan? Um, thank you, Alex. Uh, this is a great question. I've been thinking about this question for, for a while. And uh, I was indeed a bit surprised uh, to hear that, uh, especially from Albi. And, um, and, but I think this is precisely the reason that doing comparative uh, study of transitional justice, especially um, uh, to societies or to jurisdictions as culturally far apart as South Africa and Taiwan, will bring a lot of benefit into, um, into the studies. I mean, uh, by comparing uh, such a, a culturally distant societies, we can actually shed light on a lot of things that uh, remain hidden before, you know, before the study. So my, my hunch, and you know, after uh, hearing uh, uh, just this is a South Africa session, is that perhaps there is, um, um, okay, let me put it this way. So um, I think a lot of, quite a few scholars in Taiwan uh, observing transitional justice here in our own society have um, referred to Ubuntu or, or um, Christianity, you know, as this as a general you know, social ethos or whether you are whether you are a Christian or a Ubuntu believer or not, um, they discern that there is something different in the journal ethos um, that is expressed in the postamble of the South African Constitution or the or the discourse, the kind of discourse that supported or buttressed um, uh, the TRC. And we, a lot of people, whether pro-transitional uh, justice or, or uh, anti-transitional justice in Taiwan have pointed uh, out that there, it, there could be a, uh, a cultural difference. And, um, and especially one of the, one of the prominent uh, scholars in Taiwan, uh, Dr. Wu Ren, a very prominent uh, political theorist in Taiwan, have put uh, and a, a, a special emphasis on this. He's he specifically pointed out that Taiwan is a relatively quite secular uh, society. Um, secular, not in the sense, uh, or or he's not saying that South Africa is necessarily more more religious, but the kind of a religious background or cultural background is quite different. 
And um, East Asian societies, um, especially Chinese uh, culture, um, wh where a lot of people uh, are, are Chinese descendants, um, we actually come from um, a religious, where you say cultural background that combines, you say, uh, Confucianism or uh, Taoism, Buddhism, but Confucianism actually is this at the center that regulate regulate interpersonal relationships, and um, and uh, I find it very interesting to see that because um, uh, from the, that um, there are two volumes of great books that I discovered uh, just from from uh, from several years ago, written by a, a professor at National Taiwan University Chinese Literature Department. He documented um, and analyzes, analyzed Confucian can, uh, canons, you know, Confu Confucian uh, classics, all the way from, from, um, from uh, Zhou dynasty, all the way down to Qing dynasty. And he finds that there is a consistent theme of what? Uh, of Confucian glorification of revenge. Confucian glorification of revenge. So Confucianism put an emphasis on taking revenge against whom? Against those who have, for example, hurt, uh, killed your father, especially put an emphasis on, on the in a patriarchal uh, societal imagination. Whoever kills your father, you're not going to uh, live under the same sky, you know? And it's very interesting, this thing, you know, he documented all the way to, to uh, to contemporary uh, Taiwanese society, I'm not. Uh, he's not saying that there has not been a great cultural change, uh, modernization, uh, or or that Taiwanese society still glorifies revenge. But there is one very important uh, cultural background in there, which is that reconciliation in and of itself has not been uh, given such a high status as in maybe other religions. And uh, I also heard uh, another political philosopher who, who pointed this out, uh, Professor Ye Hao at uh, Jingji University, also a very prominent political philosopher here. He also pointed out the same thing. And so I, I do think that there, there could be um, something going on here that tells the difference between, between, between uh, South Africa and Taiwan. And of course, Taiwan so far uh, up to this point, uh, I think the first session of ours, uh, the Taiwanese session has already laid out the, 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 the factual background of Taiwan's transgender justice. So I don't have to uh, do it again. But um, there are a lot of practical difficulties and uh, that de pretty much delayed, delayed our transitional proce uh, justice process you know, like two decades, at least two decades late. And I think Transitional Justice Commission has done a great job, you know, collecting uh, political uh, archives and uh, uh, overturning, overturning uh, the, 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 the previous criminal convictions of those, uh, uh, of those uh, victims of the white terror. But I think um, for the next stage to come, you know, of transitional justice, I think Taiwan is entering into an area of, you know, the, the deepest water, which is, okay, so we have the, we're, we're, we can continue to dig out the truth. We can continue to collect political archives and reveal or study what is in there, find out the perpetrator maybe, or, you know, whether to reveal it to the public or not, that's another issue, but we can continue to do that. And I think there is a imperative to do that, normative imperative to do that. You know, I think it's it's important for, for a democracy to really come to grips with this past. And in order to come to grips with it, you have to know what the past is uh, precisely like. But the problem is how does the society receive all this information? How does the, what is the, what is the general uh, ethical framework, you know, that people have in mind when such information is disclosed and it is being presented to the public? And I think that's, is, that is the hard, uh, the hard part. Um, another a pioneer of, of uh, Taiwan, uh, Taiwan's transitional justice, uh, uh, Professor 
Unai de. Uh, uh, just two years ago, he he wrote a very I think is a very important piece of op-ed uh, in the newspaper, saying that the next stage mainly we should focus on dialogue. You know, because th there is a lot. There's very complex. There's very complex ethical, moral, and political normative issues back there. So I um I I, I feel that um. I feel sorry to hear Alex that you mentioned that there are perhaps in the younger generation writers who glorifies uh, and and a, a sentiment of uh, retributive justice or that kind of a punitive ethos. Uh, but I think I agree with uh, Professor Unai De that the next stage, um, what's important is dialogue. Dialogue for what? Dialogue for how to come to terms with the past, but what past? What past has to be come to terms with? I think it's not just it's not just um, dealing with the authoritarian past. I think um, um, what is very tricky and very thorny, very difficult for Taiwan, and this situation may not be present in South Africa or other com uh, or other uh, countries undergoing transitional justice, which is that. Actually, there are two paradigms of historical memories in competition in Taiwan. Can we can we maybe um, wait with the, okay, with the question of memory and truth? Yeah. So I, yes. I want to stay with this question of culture for a second. Okay. Yeah, and we will come back to truth. So now, um, I. I said to our speakers, you know, we will have to to use a bit more time than usually today, and they agreed. So, <laughs> and Professor Weigelin, yeah, um, you're not having lunch, but <laughs> I wanted you to ask. Yeah, I wanted to ask you. Um, so, is there an, an an East Asian way of reconciling? Um, um, what What are your thoughts about what Jimmy just just presented to us? I'm very careful making any general statements about this situation because even though I think culture plays a certain role and within the realm of culture of religion plays a certain role, I'm not sure whether this role is so prominent that it sort of overwrites other aspects. And uh, I can only sort of add to what, uh, to what, uh, to what uh, Mr. Xu just said um, I realized when I was working um, on issues of uh, memory and reconciliation in the People's Republic of China, uh, the word reconciliation comes up very, very rarely. And when you look at who uses the word, you will find that these people are Christians. So this is really an interesting phenomenon. And um, I think it has not been researched so far. It's like a touchy issue. You don't really want to go into this too deeply. Um, but maybe I can also refer to uh, one of my Chinese students writing a master thesis under my supervision. And she actually sort of tackled the question of what is fate in the context of um, Chinese philosophy and religion. And, she said, so many people in China do not actually uh, resist against certain very unjust policies or resist against a situation which seems unbearable to us, but they think they should show that they are able to go through this terrible situation um, because it is fate that actually sort of um, organize the situation for them. It's, it's not, they don't look at it as something that is made by human agency, but they look at it as being a situation created by fate. And as a matter of fact, when you look through even written testimonials of people going through the um, cultural evolution, um, they very often refer to the word fate. And they also very often refer to that fate not only gives them um, this terrible situation they have to go through, but it also provides them with the opportunity to show that they can manage the situation, that they can survive the situation. 
And so from a certain point of view, and this is of course very closely related if I understand the situation correctly to, uh, to Buddhism, uh, this is like a, a cartharsis situation through which you go if you are confronted with this kind of injustices and things like this. So sometimes when people who went through the situation of the Cultural Revolution um, talk to you about this issue, uh, they not only say, you know, this was an opportunity for me to show how strong I am, but they also tell me that after everything was over, their ability not to go into revenge against their perpetrators was actually their sign of moral superiority, which is more important for them than to actually go through a process of um, um, showing, you know, what is the truth of this situation, who actually is the victim, who is the perpetrator. They rather show their moral superiority in dealing even with the perpetrators and without having to accuse them as perpetrators, then, you know, going through a formal process and saying you, you are bad and I'm good. So, so this is something I have observed. Uh, I'm not yet at a point where I would feel comfortable in generalizing my, um, my, my observations and my experience with this situation. Um, and uh, all in all, I'm not sure whether the cultural factor is so strong that it actually overrules everything else. You know, Jimmy, if I'm, if I'm very honest with you, um, so one of my very first lectures when I studied Sinology, uh, we talked about democratization theory and when is China going to become democratic? And this was back in 2014. Um, and then there was this one scholar, I forgot his name, who says China cannot become a democracy because it is influenced by Confucianism. Yeah, because con Confucianism, you have a certain, you know, idea of a hierarchical society, which is not combinable with our idea of participatory democracy. And then our professor, you know, Professor Goebel said, well, I know three democracies which are influenced by Confucianism, you know, South Korea, Japan, Taiwan. So there you go. And now it's, I, thought, I found it so interesting. So now you have this very prominent Taiwanese scholar who said, oh, we would like to, we would like to reconcile, but unfortunately, because Confucius said we need to seek revenge, we cannot reconcile. What a pity. <laughs> so, so I found this very interesting. And this, so you, you can also find this in South Africa with Ubuntu, yeah, this, this is called cultural essentialism. So this idea that when you are born into a culture, your, your thinking is sort of internally locked in, in that state, that you must think that certain way. And no matter what you do, you cannot, you cannot break these boundaries. Yeah? And, and in political science, you have this discussion between the so-called culturalists, who I just talked about, and the institutionalists. So those who look at institutional, polit political, structural incentives that make certain behavior more likely or probable. And um, I am more sort of on their side. Um, one last question for Helen um, for about this cultural aspect. So um, this is a very big question for you again. Um, so I would like to ask you what role traditional leadership um, actually played in South Africa. So just for our general audience, you know, so what, what is traditional leadership? What role do traditional leaders play during democratization in Southern uh, African countries in general? And what role did traditional leaders play during the South African democratization, especially in the relationship between you know, the ANC, the Congress of Traditional Leaders of South Africa and the IFP? Good luck. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm actually just, I think there's a really interesting um, conversation that's happening in the chat, which, which in some ways speaks to this, but um, is it Zahun is asking about um, reconciliation. And I, I think that the, the, the point, I, I'm not sure, maybe perhaps I can clarify in the chat, um, but you say you all assume to ignore that. I, I'm not sure if you're referring to the panellists, but I, I do think that what you're, 
the, the, the conversation is kind of varying in this way of sort of with a lot of essentialization. And I think a, a, um, a lot of essentialism ha happened in the South African process, particularly around this, this term reconciliation. And I think um, Galtung, amongst others, sort of ha has spoken about um, how this term's got psychological, sociological, theological, philosophical backgrounds, um, but nobody actually really knows what it means. Um, and in reality, when we look at how it was used in the South African context, continues to be used, in fact, it's actually a word that's been heavily weaponized and uh, heavily politicized. Um, and, and I do think sort of as, as people working around the issue of transitional justice is one of the, the issues. Um, and I just want to sort of pick up on the point that was made um, about me not mentioning democratization. And that, that was intentional. Um, because um, and the, the, the point that um, uh, you raised afterwards about um, liberal democracy uh, or, or uh, the yeah, liberal democratic um, economy is, is part of the reason why I chose to not include it, because we've seen transitional justice being used as a process to, um, to actually bring about um, so-called liberal democracies. Um, and we've seen in, in contexts like Kenya, where the entire lexicon of transitional justice, all the different processes are, are used, they're all politicized and they're all done in order to tick the boxes of saying we have realized um, transitional justice, therefore we are democratized, when in fact all we've seen is sort of the increased oppression of the state there. Um, so, so I, you know, I advisedly, you know, I, I intentionally left out that. And I've also intentionally left out the term reconciliation in any of my discussions because I find it extremely problematic, especially in the South African context, where we've seen actually the um, those who have been most subject to marginalization and violations are the ones who are um, put in a position where they are told to reconcile. Um, and it, it continues to, to exist e even um, in the last few years when we've seen debates about whether to, which has sort of come up again in, in the um, BLM movement uh, about around um, statues and around um, sites of memory. And again, it's, it's uh, the, the, the decisions not to change anything in South Africa has been about reconciliation. That word has continued to be used by, by those in government. Um, so um, I, I know that's sort of gone um, off, off uh, slightly not, uh, of the question that you asked, but I think that um, I, I don't know if it's Zerihun is that's correct pronunciation, but I think that the question being raised here is sort of really um, important for our debate. Okay, so do you do you can I give you a second chance and, yes. and, and to talk a bit about traditional leadership? <laughs> to be honest, that's not it's not an area I feel that I'm. The appropriate person to to answer a question about traditional leadership. Um, okay. You know, okay. Yeah. But G I think Jimmy wanted to answer. Yes, Jimmy, okay. please. Yeah, uh, I'm just uh, following up, uh, Alex, and uh, uh, your 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 short comment. Um, I'm definitely not a cultural essentialist, and uh, I definitely don't think that Confucianism constitute a uh, a definite roadblock to democracy, um, uh, you know, I've lived, but um, I think there, you know, we, culture, culture is, I think, is a field of contestation and, you know, reformation. And uh, I think it is a field when people um, contest about, um, you know, or imagine together, imagine, you know, what a, uh, what a better future for a society should be like. And, um, but I would say Taiwan is a, a post-Confucian culture, uh, a society. Post-Confucian meaning that um, we, just the kind of public discourse that I'm familiar with here does not resort to uh, Confucian canons or classics. Uh, rarely, they rarely do. Uh, but I'm only talking about the kind of a cultural resources. People, you know, just sudden, just it's all in the background, you know. So, and um, uh, when you are dwelling on a very important topic, uh, 
such as justice, transitional justice, reconciliation, how do we go forward as a society together? Um, I'm talking about whether there are, are powerful, powerful uh, spiritual or, or, or rhetorical, uh, conceptual, philosophical resources for people to invoke in order to uh, first clarify the situation we're in and also point out uh, a way forward. And it's in that respect that I find that um, I think reconciliation is often talked about uh, nowadays in Taiwan's transitional justice discourse. And I think that has to, um, uh, thanks a lot to, to, to the influence of South Africa. And you see t you, you, the, the, the rhetorical influence uh, definitely because it can be felt here. Uh, reconciliation can be a scene, uh, talked about a lot, but people really, uh, just as uh, Helen just said, that um, people are still confused first about whether, just whether it is important and how to position it in a transitional justice discourse. I think a lot of Taiwanese um, uh, transitional justice advocates would tend to uh, picture or imagine um, reconciliation uh, not so much as a virtue or value that we should just implement right now along uh, right now alongside whatever transitional justice measures you're going to uh, undertake. But they imagine reconciliation as, as an endpoint, as a result, you know, which um, you just, you have to go through uh, all the way through whatever transitional justice measures you imagine that you should take. And then reconciliation will, will, be, will be brought about. And so it does not necessarily have any bearing uh, on what we should do right now. That, that's one way of, and I, I suspect that there it, it is uh, what a lot of people think uh, who those uh, more on the advocacy side think about reconciliation. And, um, but, uh, you know, as, one of my you know, colleagues, uh, Huang Chengyi's uh, recent article uh, has, has to, he, he narrated a rec the recent development. I think Alex, you also wrote, uh, read that. And Chengyi very interestingly, but Professor Huang very interestingly said that he, you know, after all the, all the development, narrating all the development, he, he, he observed that actually no one really cared about reconciliation and no one really know what reconciliation is about. And so um, um, I think that's, that, that's the situation here, but I think um, um, the more I think about this issue, I think the, the more I tend to think that there is a very deep cultural and philosophical issue hidden beneath all the public discourse that, um, that, that we should, we, we should reveal and talk about. Yeah, just okay. a follow up. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so our, our chat is going crazy. I'm very, unfortunately very bad at multitasking. Um, but so, so maybe one phrase to, to this cultural aspect. So my, my idea of culture is that what we understand as culture has usually a political background, yeah? So the, the interpretation of what is culture is political. And I'm usually more interested in that political thing. Yeah? For example, German values during the Third Reich are not German values today. <laughs> Things like that, yeah? Um, we, a, a, an area where I see that culture could really play a role in Taiwan, especially in relation to Confucianism, was would maybe what, what you, Jimmy, said would, would be power relations. So, for example, is it for a 16-year-old uh, Susanne easier to, to confront her father with his past than it is for a 16-year-old Taiwanese to confront their parents or grandparents because power structures are <laughs> differently. <laughs> Professor Weigelin is not, yeah, please. <laughs> no. Um, you no. know, during the uh, so-called 68 movement, which is the movement in Germany that is said to have overturned everything with regard to dealing with uh, our German own past, 
Well, this 68 movement um, was very interesting because none of us dared to ask our fathers and mothers what they did during the uh, Third Reich. But we asked, of course, very abstract and societal <laughs> structures. We even dared to ask our teachers. But I tell you, it was those people who started um, sort of uh, going through yet another round of confronting Germany's own past in the 1960s are those people who actually started talking to their parents when they were 60 years old, mm -hmm. shortly before their parents died and not early. Now, so this, uh, even in this respect, I don't see this enormous difference between, you know, so-called Confucianist societies and, uh, and non-Confucianist societies. Um, as a matter of fact, I don't really know what a Confucian society is. So if you if you say that Taiwan is a Confucian society, then of course, Germany, Austria, France, we should be Christian societies. Are we Christian societies? So how come that, you know, we, we can always label societies other than our own societies with some kind of cultural label, but when it comes to our own society, we say, oh, you know, we don't want to do this. So, so I, you know, I, I think that there is um, something we need to explore beyond the political, beyond the sociological, and we need to understand something, how sort of a society is accumulate certain experiences, which then become part of their cultures, in order to, to, to tackle with this very, very difficult situation. Right. And uh, I think we have we'll have to go deep in history to sort of uncover what kind of experiences societies have actually accumulated in the past in dealing with these problems. I'm a historian. And for that reason, I think, you know, looking at these things historically rather than culturally will help us to understand what kind of experiences actually societies carry with them when they have to go through yet another difficult uh, situation, post-traumatic situation. And um, I think maybe this would be a good approach that would help us more than trying to access the situation from, you know, religious studies or, um, or for example, philosophical um, studies. Uh, I think it, it, is, it would be a good idea uh, to go into history and see, you know, how, how did these societies deal with these issues in the past. Okay, thank you. Alex, thank Alex you can I, sorry, oh, can yeah. I jump in on, on that? Please. Okay, I, I think that Suzanne is raising a really interesting point um, in terms of the South African context as well. Um, exactly, you know, to the year, we had uprising amongst students um, at exactly the same period in Germany, sort of post the 1968 post Second World War, we had it from 2015 to 17 in this in this context, and a lot of the issues sort of that, that you just raised were, were also sort of quite prevalent in the South African context. That there was a younger generation who were just really um, frustrated at the lack of change, the, the, the lack of discussions that had happened. And yet there was not a possibility for an intergenerational dialogue. Um, so, so this younger generation couldn't actually negotiate with their parents' generation about how they were feeling and their experiences. Um, yet there was immense frustration about where South African society was is currently um, and the failure for, for for their parents' generation to really kind of you know step up and and challenge um, the, the current status quo. And I think it's really interesting as you said as, as uh, you know if we, we take a historical lens to start thinking about when do these issues arise? you know what are the driving forces for younger generations in, 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 in you, the German context in 1968 and in the South African context in the 2010s that actually leads um, 
leads this frustration with the lack of change. Um, and, and as you said, it, it still took a number of generations, you know, years for them then to even have those conversations with an older generation. And I, I think it's really fascinating, you know, what, what we can actually discover from that about, you know, let, let's not just think about what happens in the legal sector or in terms of sort of, you know, what, what cosmetic changes we've seen. What is it that makes societal transformation occur? And, and, and ultimately, that's what TJ should be about. Sorry, I just wanted to add that in. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. So let, let me, so I'm, I realized something very interesting in South Africa that transitional justice scholars or not, the whole scholarship tries away, uh, shies away from asking this question about traditional leadership. So when I wrote my article about the TRC, one of my su supervisors here said to me, um, Alex, in South Africa, you can, you know, criticize the ANC into the ground, it's fine, but keep your fingers away from the traditional leaders. Um, so the, the, the reason why I'm bringing this topic up is because I actually read it in Anki Kroh. Um, and she writes that a lot of South African countries during democratization need to somehow arrange themselves with the traditional leaders. So in South Africa, you have the Zulus and they have the king and the Kosa and all these and all these former kingdoms. Yeah, these are traditional leaders. Um, and she also writes that in Mozambique, for example, there was an attempt to, to get rid of this traditional leadership because they said this is not a democratic institution, you know, they're not democratically elected. And then the, the traditional leaders, you can find this in her second book, mobilized their supporters and almost caused another revolution. And then the democratic government sort of arranged themselves with it. And it, a lot of South African governments and Helen, please correct me if I'm wrong, actually need to find a way to incorporate them either into the government or into a non-government organization um, because they play a certain role. And very interestingly, so I Googled this yesterday and two months ago, um, Cyril Ramaphosa, yeah, the current president, quoted, so I, I think there's some kind of a traditional, cre traditional leader crisis um, going on again in South Africa, I'm not very familiar with the topic, and he quoted what the head of the um, Congress of Traditional Leaders of South Africa said in 1990. So the, the Congress of Traditional Leaders of South Africa was an organization where the traditional leaders organized themselves in an organization in the late 80s, so closely before democratization. And in 1990, the head of that organization said, said if all our chiefs and kings were to stand up and speak with one voice, telling their people that we are one nation, even if we differ in language and culture, then all our petty differences would come to an end. And my theory, and there's no research about that, so I don't know, is that South African democratization would have been let's not say impossible, would, would, would have been harder if the ANC would have not had the support from this Congress of traditional leaders. And just keep this in mind when we go back now to our last topic, which would be, and some, somebody in the um, comment section now talks about truth-telling. So this is the third topic I want to explore today. And um, which is this question, you know, this never ending question. And this weekend there was an event about transitional justice in Taiwan, in Taiwan again, and they said truth reconciles. So does, does truth reconcile or divide? Let's talk about this, yeah? Um, let me maybe start with Jimmy. So in, in, in Taiwan, there's this whole discussion about whether the names of the perpetrators should be made public or not. Um, and other people say, yes, we need to make them public. We need to open the archives. And others say, no, um, this will disrupt our society. We should you know, keep them closed. Um, so could you elaborate a little bit on the different opinions on what to do with these uncomfortable truths, let's call it like that, and, and what your personal opinion is on this delicate matter? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so I think... Uh, Alex, what you're talking about mainly uh, has to do with the political archives that has been, that has been uh, studied uh, in recent years, thanks to 
thanks to um, Transitional Justice Commission's work, uh, especially on the on on the web of surveillance that the authoritarian state has imposed on the society, uh, a very very intricate and comprehensive web that uh, monitors. Uh, the society, all the sectors that uh, raises concerns for the authoritarian regime's stability. And um, um, so, so what you said about perpetrators uh, uh, in recent discussion mainly has to do with the informant. And then we have a situation quite similar to, uh, to the post-communism uh, East or Central Europe uh, or East Germany. Um, the kind of a uh, uh, Stasi files being being uh, you know being there and then uh, then disclosed. Um, uh, but what is more interesting, even more interesting, is that um, so I think Taiwan's Taiwan's situation is a bit different in the timeline. So the severest the the, the severest uh, human rights uh, violations happened. Uh, mainly before before the 70s. You know, the white terror mainly happened during the 50s and 60s. And white terror is, a, it, it is an era that, you know, the kind of a persecution is highly, um, is very well um, documented because those persecutions were done in the, in the court of law, in the, a lot of them in the martial courts, uh, in the court of marshals. Uh, uh, even trying not just not just military personnel, but also civilians, because we we're under a martial law uh, due to the prolonged uh, prolonged so-called civil war uh, between the communists uh, and Chinese communists and nationalists, and and so um, what has been missing is that especially two two eight incidents, because two two eight incidents is not as well documented, but the white terror is pretty well documented. And so um, the continuing uh, uh, discovery or study of the political, uh, pro, uh, political archives will continue to, uh, to dis just reveal. But, you know, 50s and 60s, those so-called perpetrators, um, they could be judges, they could be, you know, military police, or of course, some, of the, some part of it, remain in the dark because it's mainly in the, uh, for example, in the investigative uh, uh, process that uh, so people are, the, the defendants were tortured or they were being uh, violated, you know, in the dark, you know, in the inter invest, uh, interrogation rooms. But, you know, the, the, the trial parts are, are pretty open uh, and uh, just awaiting study. And so, um, as for as for as for the informant uh, archives, uh, there is definitely controversy uh, out there. You know, informant is actually the you know the very end of the of the web of the authoritarian state apparatus, and uh, they are the small potatoes, even though they play important parts. Uh, but they are they are there, and uh, the, the the thing got pretty. Of course, there are people who who um, who just advocate for for complete disclosure, but uh, many of the people are um, are. So I, I just found out uh, a recent survey done by Academia Sinica. Uh, the, the, uh, it's a regular survey, but the most uh, the recent one has incorporated uh, parts of this transitional justice questionnaires, and. Uh, um, so with regard to the disclosure of the surveillance document or, or archives, um, the popular, the, the, those people surveyed 59.8, so 60, almost 60% 60 uh, of, the, of the people, uh, of the population, Taiwanese population being surveyed, prefers not to disclose it. So 60%. Uh, those who are in favor of disclosure uh, only there is only thirty six point three percent, and so do they so, say? So, do they say why? Uh, no, it's just you know, it's just yeah. a survey. It's just yeah. a re you know revelation of the preference, and uh, uh, so so the reason uh, awaits uh, study, 
but you can see that there's a general sentiment of pe people uh, being hesitant. So uh, in the past one or two years, there are instances where um, um, the the green, just the DPP, the green, the the uh, the old time opposition party, the the Democrat, the Democratic reformers, uh, uh, legislator uh, who are who turned out to be an, an informant, so uh, he had to resign. And uh, also, uh, I have heard stories about about, for example, um, the P Taiwanese Presbyterian Church, one of the major opposition force. Uh, democratic reformers uh, during the uh, authoritarian era. Um, of course, such a reformist uh, church uh, were, were being surveilled uh, under surveillance, put under surveillance by the authoritarian state. And when they came closer and closer to, uh, to the archives, uh, a lot of them, you know, within the church uh, hesitated about uh, dis just the disclosure because uh, it could go too deep, and uh, a lot of people are in the in the you know operated in the past in the gray area, and uh, you know they 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 might have thought of themselves as mediators you know between the state and the you know, the, you know they, there are all sorts of situations, and uh, some some more some more excusable and some perhaps less excusable, and um, and it, it seems that. It seems that there is uh, not a high high degree of consensus uh, within the civil society or or even uh, among the general population of whether to disclose it or not. I think the informant makes uh, the who is the real perpetrator and who uh, deserves to be disclosed makes it more difficult. But of course, I think there are there are clear cut uh, cases. Uh, for example, uh, in the eighties, the 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 Lin Yixiong, uh, 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 families uh, being massacred, uh, being murdered, uh, uh, opposition leader family being murdered. You know that case. I think um, I think there is a, a high degree of consensus, at least among the civil society, that if the perpetrator can be found, he has to be disclosed. He has to be held accountable. But the problem is, you know, it, it's still so difficult. Um, you know, uh, the, such crimes, the heinous crimes were, were being hidden by the, perhaps, you know, uh, uh, arguably by the, by the intelligence or national security uh, uh, cells. So, yeah, that's, I, I think that's, that's what uh, it's the most recent development. Thank you. Thank you for this wonderful summary. So, so you talked about, you know, that still the difficulty to bring a definition of who are, who are the perpetrators and all these different you know, stages of responsibility. And very yes. interestingly, so most people, the survey said, are not in favor of disclosing the information about those informants. So what one of the recurring themes in our, in our um, you know, series has been this question of ambiguity. Um, so Professor Weigelin, let me, let me ask you this question. We, we discussed this earlier, but why, why is this question of ambiguity so sensitive and so difficult and so and so hurtful sometimes you know one of the reasons maybe that people in taiwan would prefer not to have all the information disclosed on what happened during the white terror era is that they know that they live in ambiguity not only in the past but also in the present but when it comes to the truth, then suddenly there is no, no space for ambiguity. And I think this is one of the reasons why if people would hesitate to say, okay, we definitely need to know the truth about all this. You know, there are only very, very few people who can actually define themselves as 100% victim of a certain political system, let's put it that way. And there are only very, very few people who could define themselves as 100% perpetrators, um, you know, of, in, under a certain political system. Most people are victims during a certain period of time and then they become perpetrators or vice versa. They are first perpetrators and then become victims. Sometimes they become uh, victims and then perpetrators again. So the situation is, is very, 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 very difficult when it comes to assessing 
the uh, situation of an individual under repressive regimes. And when I talked earlier about the fact that we did not dare to ask our parents what they actually did during the Third Reich, I think we had this inherent hesitance, um, thinking that you know uh, they would then would not be able to present a white West. You know, they would always sort of be in between us. And I think the reason why we had this inherent um, feeling about the situation is because if you look at yourself and if you reflect about your existence in the present, then you will very clearly realize that you're always in between, right? You're, you're, you're doing something that you might, you actually don't really want to do according to your principles, but then there are pragmatic reasons that you need to do this. And then there are other things that uh, you really try to stick to your principles and, and you see that it is um, a very, very difficult job. And so this ambiguity is something that is um, extremely uh, sort of is something that a society needs to be able to cope with. So from my point of view, and maybe this is idealizing this issue, but um, I think the very, really interesting a uh, situation in Taiwan is that Taiwan can only survive in ambiguities. Uh, as soon as you give up your resilience in handling in um, an ambiguity, you will run into enormous problems. And we see, of course, that the current geopolitical situation sort of pushes us into giving up our ambiguities and taking sides. You know, if you listen to what the uh, US American ambassador to the UN said, you know, you either go with the Ukrainians or against them, you know, and, and really, you know, there are quite a few countries, as we know, who preferred to stay in between, right? And the situation in Taiwan is very difficult. We know all this. And, and uh, of course, in this situation, you might think that if you go for one of the two sides, you are maybe safer than staying in this uncertain, ambiguous situation in between. But so far, Taiwan has survived as an independent entity because of the resilience of your population in handling this ambiguity. And I think that this is admirable, and, but we also see that how this ambiguity or this living in the middle of ambiguity has its limits. Because as you just told us, you know, when you need resilience in coping with your own past, <laughs> maybe you feel overwhelmed by too much ambivalence that you need to, to, to deal with. And um, I think this is um, also true for other countries that go for, through or similar situations or went through similar situations in the past. So ambiguity is actually something that is, um, you know, if we talk about culture, <laughs> I think quite interestingly, um, the resilience of dealing with ambiguity is maybe closer to uh, Asian culture than to uh, European culture. And maybe this is something we, we might want to sort of create as a um, you know, very concrete question we might be able to, to pose and answer, you know, um, uh, rather than just talking about a culture in a very, very, very general sense of the word. And this kind of ambigu ambiguity um, has its merits and it has its limits because uh, as I said at the beginning of my, my uh, answer, I assume that maybe it is this knowledge about ambiguity that tells people we better don't look too closely into what happened during the white terror era. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there are obviously different, you know, motivations for people to refuse the disclosure of these archives and, and different, different motivations for people who wanted to open. Actually, this weekend, there was this event at the Chen Wencheng Memorial Foundation, and one of the uh, one of you know the politicians Fan Yun, um, she she was allowed to look in some of her archives, and then they found out you know um, that during this resistant democratization 
democratization movement and the student movement, there were some informants in her group. And her answer was, so her sort of emotional reaction was to this was she was first she was sad because this destroyed her memory of this you know beautiful student movement where everybody fought together in solidarity and this made her sad and it made her angry because because the names are not um, made public she needs now to suspect everyone who could be you know the mole <laughs> And this makes her very angry. But but she says, you know, if these if there would be sort of a TRC in Taiwan, um, she would probably, I mean, she's a politician, you know, she said she would probably forgive the person, but she also explains why, because she was not traumatized. Well, she was a victim, but she was a very, you know, her victimhood is relatively small compared to the people who were imprisoned for 15 years or even tortured. And for them, this is obviously a different question than for her. So, th so there you would allow me yeah. to just refer to the German situation because, uh, mm. as we know, in Eastern Germany, although we had a regime change in Eastern Germany, we didn't have a process of transitional justice. And uh, despite the fact that we didn't have a process of transitional, uh, traditional, uh, transitional justice, people were allowed to look into their Stasi files, mm -hmm. right? And our society survived this. Very interestingly, our society, German society, survived this, this. And how could we survive this? I think one of the really astonishing aspects of this process was that the looking into the files uh, of individuals and knowing you know, that your wife <coughs> maybe was your uh, informant, was the informant of the Stasi, reporting on everything you said at the... Um, breakfast table, right? Um, all this was left on a very individual level. So there was no public deliberation on what these people found in their individual Stasi files. Everything was sort of the resilience and the ability of the individual to cope with this kind of information. So it didn't have a um, a very, very enormous effect on society at large. And uh, to a certain degree, this seems to have been uh, quite a, a positive experience. But you see as of now that the fact that basically Western German elites decided we didn't want to have a public uh, assessment of communist Germany um, has the consequence that now people in Eastern Germany have their stories about their past and people in Western Germany have their stories about the Eastern part, uh, past. So Germany is divided because it doesn't have a unified narrative on its own history. And, and this is what I think um, the um, elites in Western Germany um, are responsible of. And some of the very, very uh, deep going problems we are encountering in, in Germany at this moment actually go back to this decision. I'm, I'm, I'm very convinced about this. Helen, let me, let me go back to you. So, so I think this whole question, you know, does truth reconcile or divide is too simplified to be answered truthfully. So I think when, when we really want to make transitional justice into a theory, what we need to ask is under which circumstances to which truths have what social effect? And then you can maybe, so then you can have variables and then so this is the question political scientists can sort of work with. So I want you to, uh, I want to ask you, does the transitional justice as a concept or as a theory actually develop something like that? Under which circumstances do which truths have what social effect? Or, or is it still on the same level? Does truth divide or not? Another interesting question. I mean, I, I, you see, I, I'm going to, I think there's a difference between what you're talking about in terms of the, the theoretical and the you know, tangible examples that we, we can look at. And mm. I think that what we've seen or we're increasingly seeing is um, manufactured truths. 
So you have a particular version of truth that is seen as necessary for a transition to a democracy. And that manufactured truth will support a particular version of the past. I mean, I, I know definitely sort of as, as practitioners, we, we would always speak about sort of, you know, it's the questions that goes into the computer that decides the outcome. So if you don't ask certain questions or if you invisibilize certain things in the process, um, it's going to determine the, the type of outcome that comes. Um, and so, you know, and, and it's come up repeatedly in this session that sort of that there are certain truths which were um, foregrounded in the Taiwanese situation in the same way certain truths were foregrounded in the South African situation. But as long as we kind of um, fail to have like a plurality of truths, we end up sort of having, creating hierarchies of, of versions of the past or, or a, a sort of particular version of the past, which, which then continues to allow injustices to be perpetuated. Um, and I think that's sort of, that, that is the difference again between, it, between sort of going back to what the intent of transitional justice is and how it's been realized um, that there's a there's a major gap, and I don't think that it is um, it's an accident that we see societies embracing a particular version of a truth which suits, in the same way that the reconciliation discourse does, suits the survival of certain power structures and leaves them intact throughout any transition. That sounds a bit cynical, but that's kind of my my version. Okay, yeah, so I'm I'm personally obviously very interested with this question and I tried to develop something. It's it, it a bit it escalated a bit. I don't know if we have time for it. Um so sort of I I I come in from a different perspective. So I first ask, does truth reconcile or divide? Okay, then I first ask, when is a topic sensitive? Maybe we should start here. A topic is sensitive when the power or the interest of someone are threatened. So in the People's Republic of China, which topics are sensitive? Those that threaten the legitimacy of the Communist Party of China. That's why you cannot talk about Tiananmen. Okay. Now for victims, this is obviously also an important issue because victims base the legitimacy of their political demands on their victim status. So I am a victim of X and therefore I demand for the perpetrators to be punished and for compensation, and so on and so on. So when you introduce these ambiguous narratives and say, well, but not all of you were victims, you know, some of you collaborated with the Nazis and some of you committed human rights violations, you're sort of attacking their victim status. And with that, you're attacking their, the legitimacy of their political demands and therefore their power and their interests. And that's why for victims, the question of ambiguity is a very dangerous topic. I think this is one of the reasons, the many reasons for this, but you know, when, when today, when you write a book that a Jew sold out Anne Frank, it makes the world news because when you question this Jewish victim narrative and the state of Israel, the legitimacy of the state of Israel is based on that victimhood, it sounds like you're also questioning the legitimacy of that state. And that's why this makes the world news. And then it turns out that the guy didn't even have the evidence to prove this, to prove his you know, theory, and then it makes the world news again. Um, so, so this is one point where I would say these uncomfortable truths have a potential to divide. But then, you know, and I look at South Africa and I read, I read Anki Croft's book and she writes all these things, you know, the ANC executed their spies by burning them alive. You know, they were the heroes and they, and they raped women and they were betrayers in the resistance movement and there were people betrayed by the resistance movement. And then she asked, yeah, but you know, most black people didn't join the resistance. So through accepting apartheid, are they kind of co-responsible? And she asks all this and she throws it at you. And I'm just asking myself, how does this not cause a revolution? <laughs> like usually this, was, usually this would, would upset the whole country. So my theory, and I talked about this with Luando um, in a private conversation. And unfortunately, because she had load shedding, she couldn't develop it in our discussion in SA. My theory was... Um, that 
in South Africa, it was not a victim-centered narrative, but it was much more heroic-centered narrative. So the ANC has freed the country. And this narrative is much less fragile. So you can say, you know, the human rights violations also committed by the ANC struggle. You could say these, this was necessary collateral damage in a, you know, armed fight for freedom. You can even go one step further and say, no, these were mistakes. We need to acknowledge and apologize. But nothing of this really contradicts um, the fact that, you know, the ANC freed the country. And therefore, and therefore, um, these ambiguous narratives cannot develop this disruptive force. And Rwanda said, no, she doesn't believe this <laughs> because the ANC actually um, works very little with, you know, narratives. Yeah, the ANC had so much support. Um, she said that in the, in the townships, in the communities, there was sort of a sense of whom you could trust, who you could run to if you would encounter problems and who you should rather avoid. So when during the TRC, when all these ambiguous narratives came up, um, people kind of knew, they were not really impressed in the sense of they were presented with something they did not, um, um, they did not sort of anticipate. And in the case of East Germany, when you suddenly found out that your wife, you know, has been reporting everything to the country, this was a new information. This was something totally different. Um, so, so um, and starting from this sort of thinking, um, I, I developed a whole, you know, theory asking under which circumstances can which truth have what effect? So what I say is in a situation like in South Africa, where the two main parties, so now I'm putting everything together that we have learned in this, you know, in this whole forum. So in a country in South Africa, where you have the two main parties reaching an agreement about the future of the country, um, where inside and outside the country, where, where there are incentives inside and outside the country, and Encouraging, sort of encouraging cooperation. So when you look at the South African democratization, you need to know it was at the end of the Cold War, the mm -hmm. apartheid government lost support from the US, the ANC struggle lost support from the Soviet Union. Yeah, there was no monetary and military support anymore. The expenditures rise on the side of the uh, apartheid government for national security. The economic system was not sustainable. There were economic sanctions imposed on South Africa. So mm -hmm. this sort of brought the apartheid mm -hmm. government on, okay, let's maybe go into that direction. And on the ANC side, you know, they had mili limited military capabilities being confronted with what it said to be the strongest military in Africa. Mm -hmm. The apartheid struggle was increasingly, um, you know, was increasingly getting violent, starting to, loo to lose legitimacy. Some people say, maybe we can discuss this, yeah. And the ANC, and I read this in the, in the Cambridge History of South Africa, but the guy didn't provide me with a source, so I don't know whether it's true. But um, it said uh, the ANC is in exile, was also getting pressure from the foreign governments to remove their troops finally, yeah. So there were incentives from inside and outside to reach an agreement. Then third point, it was in the socioeconomic interest to give up seeking vengeance, as I said at the beginning. And actually, you know, these old pope promises of a rainbow nation and having a better life and so on and so on. Um, then fourth point, there was an additional inside force creating cohesion in the community, which were the traditional leaders. I think, yeah. Um, and fifth point, as I just said, these uncomfortable truths were semi-known. In such a political environment, ambiguity can develop a sort of mass, much less polarizing potential. But in a situation in Taiwan, you know, where the two main parties have very little common agreement about the future of the country, they cannot even decide on what to call the country, where there are no incentives to compromise on moral issues. 
because when we talked about the three dimensions of morality, legal justice, Taiwan is already a democracy. You don't need to compromise on this anymore. The socioeconomic issue, Taiwan has a very little, um, has a very low Gini coefficient. So the only thing that is left is this moral issue. So what, what do you trade this moral issue with? Yeah, forgetting democracy. The only thing you can trade it with is actually fighting against the CCP. Yeah? Third point, where there is a threat from outside dividing the country um, and threatening the country. And fourth point, where these uncomfortable truths are unknown in such a you know, geopolitical and, and political constellation, these truths can develop a much bigger disruptive force. This is my theory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can I, can I respond? Please. Yeah. So I think um, uh, Alex, as well as uh, Susanna and Helen, you have brought up um, uh, the element of uh, geopolitics and that is very important to understand Taiwan's uh, transitional justice, you know, the power relations around it. So um, I think the um, geopolitically, um, the, the, the most uh, dire situation of Taiwan is that, of course, the China, Chinese threat. Um, how do we deal with it? And I think the um, the green part, uh, the green camp of Taiwan's uh, in the uh, uh, in Taiwan, or those that are more pro-Taiwan independence, uh, tend to um, tend to want to um, just say goodbye, total goodbye, you know, to the to the framework of national narrative of civil war, you know, between Nationalist Party and the and and the Communist, because if there is a military threat, you don't want China to, to be able to claim that this is a civil war. Uh, this is a continuation of civil war. And so um, we are not committing the, the, the crime of international law, humanitarian law of you know, initiating, initiating a war against a neighboring country. You know, Ukraine right now can invoke international community support because it is an independent country, and no, no doubt about that. But um, the pro-Taiwan pro-independence political camp would definitely not want uh, the framework, the civil war, uh, civil war framework, to continue. And so, um, so that is the the ambiguity that Susanna uh, talked about. Um, that Taiwan you know, some people in Taiwan would definitely want to get rid of. But, you know, the situation is far more complex than that. So on the other hand, you know, you can also understand that if, if Taiwan independence is declared, that will provoke China to, to initiate an uh, immediate attack. So Taiwan is, again, caught in between. And, and there is a a very strong internal force of breaking the ambiguity because not just geopolitically, because it, it depends on you know your 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 imagination or your your prediction of the ta Taiwan's international situation, where your support will come from, and how the situation will come about uh, if there is a military threat. But within Taiwan, Taiwan's democratization is very much tied up with Taiwan's. Um, Taiwanese nationalism. And this is something that is uh, uh, probably separates Taiwan from South Africa because, Ta you know, the, uh, Alex, you just said, you know, the two camps don't even agree on what the country should be called. Should it be the Republic of Taiwan or should it continue to be the Republic of China in Taiwan? And so it represents two very, very conflicting narratives. And the rise of Taiwanese nationalism, you know, all nationalism uh, will require an identity that share a, a national narrative, historical narrative. And what better narrative than the common collective suffering? You know, collective suffering has always in history, in human history, you know, been the most important factor of constituting a national identity. So the, the, the pro-independence camp tend to, um, 
you know, come to want to come back again and again to to a white terror, you know, and uh, and actually Taiwanese nationalism grew along with it, you know, in the post-war years, especially in out overseas Taiwanese communities, that they 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 saw what the their so-called the Chinese fellows could do to them, you know, so they they there's they grew there's this sense of you know we want to be autonomous, we want to be separated. This sense, you know, is complicating, you know, uh, and uh, comes against in, in contradiction with the Chinese narrative and uh, uh, the, the Taiwan's national title, Republic of China, bears that national narrative, which goes, you know, a, a totally different one. You know, that China is that China, which, you know, has been been through um, uh a fight that that fought uh, Western imperialism, you know, throughout the Western uh, uh, throughout the twentieth century, you know, fought fought uh, Japan, Sino Japan, Japanese War, World War Two, you know, that kind of a uh, that kind of a narrative uh, that they even though they lost they lost the Chinese Civil War, they still want to maintain the 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 the, the ideal. Uh, of a republic, a free, a really truly free republic of China, these two lines of narratives uh, don't mingle, and uh, they tend to highlight the kind of sufferings that are that are uh, antithetical to the other narrative, and I think that's the biggest uh, difficulty for Taiwan. We talked about the disclosure of of informants. You know these. Um, these specific uh, truth. But I think for Taiwan, the most difficult part is uh, what, what kind of a meta narrative these truths are going to be embedded in. And, um, and these con the conflict uh, comes the most prominent in the way people are now uh, treating the past authoritarian leaders such as Jiang Kai-shek and Jiang Jingguo, Jiang Kai-shek's son. And uh, so, so I'm just pointing out that definitely there's power struggle internally and uh, externally, and um, all these truths being revealed. How are how are these truths to be embedded and to be um, supporting one narrative or the other? I think that is the most difficult. Uh, that that is the dilemma uh, that is trapping Taiwan now. So I was told we need to. Um start to wrap up the session um, but I will give everyone time for a sh short statement just one comment to what Jimmy just said so I think so we we say a democracy cannot just have one story but democracy needs to have very many different stories and I think we need to maybe pre be more precise a bit because in Taiwan you have two or maybe three national histories so maybe we should say a democracy needs, needs one story but it needs to allow different versions of that story. So what is that one story? But when you have two stories competing, then it's a, then it's a different story. <laughs> um, and what, what I see in Taiwan, especially in the green, green camp, what's going on, and I think Jenny's book actually helped me to understand is this idea of a normative and a representative approach to memory politics. So one camp says, you know, we are, um, we stand at the side of human rights and justice and reconciliation. And therefore, because we are protecting these democratic rights, we can impose our view on history on the whole society. And then you have the other side who says, no, we need dialogue. And this is a dilemma. I think this is a structural dilemma you have in democracies while negotiating memory politics. OK, now I'd like to give everyone um, the final statement until I will wrap up the session. Uh, Professor Weigeling, do you want to start? First of all, I, I would like to thank you for this really interesting and wonderful discussion and the whole series was really remarkable. Thank you very much. And um, uh, with regard to what you said last, I think that um, in democracies, we are not empowered to define how many stories we allow to exist. Uh, the interesting thing about democracy is that while we know that history is very important for defining our identity, uh, a well-functioning 
democracy doesn't have the need to convince its citizen of the one and only uh, story about its history. And the fact that um, maybe all over the world, we are all struggling to find the one truth in history is the sign of democracies going through a very, very fundamental crisis at this moment. And uh, in this crisis moment, we lose our liberal mind and allow for people to voice different ideas about their own past. As a matter of fact, I think we should be proud uh, of living under conditions where we can uh, allow for many different stories about the past to contest with each other and to compete with each other, excuse me, to compete with each other. I think we should be proud of this rather than looking at this one solution in several versions or even only one solution. And um, while I do understand that uh, when societies under, are under pressure and are in crisis as we are in Europe at this moment, and that they are looking for easy solutions, uh, I must say that um, uh, having gone through a long and peaceful period of democ uh, democracy in Europe uh, for most of my life, I'm appalled by the fact that our democracies are so weak at this moment that in the middle of a democratic structure, our media are telling us what to think about many issues, including what to think about our own past. And I don't think we can survive as democracies if this tendency will go on. Thank you. Helen, please. I'm not really sure how to follow that. <laughs> but I, I, I think just um, just a, a point about the, um, the disputes about names of countries. I, I'm, as Seppo Madlingozi has pointed out, um, South Africa, where we are like, me and Alexandra are located right now, is a, the name is a geographical location. It is not a name of a country. It's one of the only places, South Sudan, one of the most recent um, new countries in the world, is the only other country on the continent which, which is named after a geographical location. So I think, you know, it, it sums up a lot about the current state of South Africa that there's not even enough of a unified identity to have a name of a country apart from where it is located. Um, I, I think, Alexander, you and I need to have a conversation over some of the points you raised because I think there's a lot, lot more nuance needed in your analysis of, of the current uh, or the, the past and the present in South Africa. Um, I, I think what's, um, what's critical is that we know that the past is in the present in South Africa right now, that the, the, the truth of our past has yet to be revealed. Um, and that at the moment, there are multiple versions of South Africa's truths, um, which are not communicated with each other. Um, a lot of denialism that, that is being perpetuated as a result. So um, I think South Africa is a work in progress um, and, um, and that um, the, the, the discussions about how to address truth is, is very far from resolved. Um, but thank you so much for such a fantastic forum. It's been, it's been absolutely fascinating. And I, I really have appreciated learning from my fellow panelists. So it's been a, a, a huge educational experience for me. So thank you. Thank you too. Jimmy, please. Yeah, and thank you, Alex. Uh, and also I wanna thank Helen and Susanna. Uh, it's been a privilege uh, to 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 be in this panel with you. So, um, so for for I would say for Taiwan, um, you know, for any country that is facing external threat, um, or uh, just like the Ukrainian and Russian war right now, we're undergoing war. Always uh, tend to uh, turn people into you know a world of black and white. Um, and I think that is, the, I, I, I would tell my uh, Taiwanese fellows that it was precisely in those environment 
uh, back in the uh, Chinese Civil War, uh, uh, when it came to become a matter of life and death, you know, people tend to become just, you know, see only back black and white. And it, and this kind of seeing things, this kind of perspective breeds, breeds oppression the most easily. You know, when, when you are absolutely sure you are on the white side, you have no reason to hold back, you know, from oppressing the white, uh, the black side. And, but, you know, for, for, for a democracy to succeed and to be, to be uh, entrenched, I think th the spirit of liberalness that Susanna just talked about is very important. And so you want, you want us, if you want a de uh, democracy to sustain itself uh, uh, against external threat, then you have to cultivate uh, a spirit of liberalness. And, you know, at the same time, you know, you can only face external threat uh, if you are united together, you, ha you have, and in Taiwan, I think transitional justice, the most important for, for the future of transitional justice is, is to seek to unite people rather than divide people in the process. And I think the, the spirit of dialogue and liberalness is extremely important. I think reconciliation should have bearing on every step of the future measures of transitional uh, justice. And whatever that means, I think reconciliation should be on everybody's mind. And for that, I would say, you know, I, uh, a, a large thanks to the South African uh, heroes <laughs> um, who have promoted the idea so much around the world. And thank you very much. Okay, thank you to the three of you. Um, yeah, you know, so the, in, in th there's this whole discussion in Taiwan studies, what Taiwan studies is. And when, 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 we, when I talk with my supervisor about what Sinology is, she said, we study China, not because we want to give policy recommendations to the Chinese government, but because we need to understand China in Europe. Now with Taiwan, I think I'm in a very different situation because what do I do when I listen to a Taiwanese scholar last week who said, there are no Nazis in Germany anymore. Um, in what position does this put me? Do I just acknowledge it and go on with my life? Or is it sort of my, my responsibility to talk to some scholars and be like, okay, maybe you got there something wrong. And this, this was the idea behind the forum. So I'm not an expert on all these issues, but what I can do, I can organize a platform where I can get experts together from all different countries, you know, a country, a, an expert from Germany, an expert from South Africa, an expert from Taiwan, and let them talk. Um, so I think this is this is one of of the things you know Taiwan studies can can do build bridges. Um, before we end the forum, I would like to thank a few people. Yeah, this has been going on for long enough now. I'm sorry. Um, I would like to thank uh, Dimitri Abrahams, uh, who has been my supervisor here in the center. And um, you, you, when I wrote my article about the TRC here, you know, I, we had a lot of discussions and I learned a lot of him about South Africa and basically my knowledge it, it, a lot of things I presented today would have been impossible without all the conversations I had with him so I'm very thankful for that I'm also very thankful for Justine um, Changunda she has been you know designing our posters she's now on zoom with us uh, organizing everything but she he, she's also been a very big emotional and moral support in the center. And uh, without her, I don't think this, that this you know, whole forum would have come out like that. I also want to thank Heather Blumenthal, the director um, who had my back uh, while I was organizing this whole thing because apparently it's a tricky issue to organize an event with the word comparison in it in a Holocaust center, but Heather had my back, so it was fine. Thank you for that. <laughs> I would also like to Thank my very good friend, Lin Yuxuan, who actually helped us promote the whole thing in Taiwan. She translated the stuff and we, were, we have been chatting almost daily over the past three months just, just for this event. Also, obviously, a very big thank you to all of our speakers from whom I have learned so much, yeah, partly during the discussion, but also partly by reading your publications in order to prepare for the discussions. Um, and last but not least, I would also like to thank um, Director General David Lin, 
um, without so so you know we we approached him I am a terrible procrastinator uh, and we approached him very late and say you know we want to make this event um, um, can we get funding and uh, the next day he invited us to his office and we had we had coffee and tea and and one week later he said the budget is approved um, so this was a very wonderful experience. Thank you so much. So, um, Director General, I would like to give you the honor to hold the closing remarks for this forum. If you are here and if you could switch your camera on. So I see the microphone was just turned on. So maybe the camera. Oh yeah, and one more one more sentence to our audience. So today I did not interact with the chat. Um, at all. <laughs> I'm very sorry. Yeah, Professor Weigelin um, took care of that for me. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> but I will make sure to actually reach out to, to all of the people who had questions and I will send the chat to our speakers. Um, so, and so and I will make sure to, to come back to you. So at least you get you get also you can feel that you were part of this as well. <laughs> Um, okay. Alex, I think that maybe David was called away um, and, and is not here at the moment. So just on behalf of David um, and ourselves at the Cape Town Holocaust and Genocide Center, it really has been a very, very enlightening talk. Um, I think it's gone beyond the expectations of what we imagined um, what David imagined and, and even of what Alex um, imagined. Um, I think that it's just, it's raised so many different questions. The discussions and debates have been really wonderful. And um, I think it's been our honor to be able to have hosted this as a platform from Cape Town um, at the Cape Town Holocaust and Genocide Center and um, as Alex mentioned, I'd like to speak, thank all of the speakers who participated in the four um, forums, um, as well as the audience. Um, it was wonderful to have a worldwide audience um, who was very involved. Um, for those who missed any of the prior um, discussions that we had, we will be putting it onto our YouTube page um, in order for people to, to watch and catch up those that they missed. But thank you all. Keep up the hard work of, of learning, exploring, investigating, and most of all, questioning. Thank you. And thanks to you, Alex, for your hard work. You've really done a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thanks to everyone. Thank you. Well done, Alex, and thank you very much, uh, Professor Weigling and Skellen. I look forward, uh, maybe someday in the future, I'll meet you in person. Yes, it was a wonderful discussion and we should continue. Thank you yes. for bringing us together, Alexander Novakovic, and bye-bye uh, to everyone. We have had bye -bye. a long discussion now. I think we could have gone on and on and on and on. <laughs> But, yes. Uh, somehow we have come to an end, and um, uh, I thought it was a really good discussion, and I learned a lot. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye bye.